session uh, when we have such uh, great speakers like, like uh, Professor Satya Vrat Shastri, for example. But the problem is that we are very limited with the time. And I was told that we shall start now and give the word to Professor Shastri. And then we are to leave at one uh, uh, thirty, so that to have lunch with minister, and then we shall be, be back and continue the session. It's not my decision, of course, and that's why I can't properly introduce the speaker, but I am sure uh, you read about him and you know him well, so let us not his time and give him the time to speak. Before I start my presentation, I would like to offer my hearty felicitations to my dear friend Professor Stephen Crowe for being conferred the World Indology Prize. I had the opportunity of working with him at the seminar for Indology Tubingen. I had a very nice time there, the memories of which I cherish always. I found Professor Stephen Crown a very caring, loving, and affable person. When I was to leave back for India on completion of my assignment, a farewell function was organized at the residence of a colleague at Tübingen. There, Professor Stephen Crown had recited the following verses, which can give the learned audience here an idea of his command of the Sanskrit diction. I read out the stanzas which he had composed in Sanskrit. Professor Satyavra Shastra Mahodayanam Prasthana Kali Nebaddham Kushala Vada Chatushtayam Bharata Rajadhanya Yog Yakarana Vidam Varaha Paraga Sarva Vidyanam Kavinam Mukute Sthitaha Shashasa Satyam Avritya Shastri Shastra Visharadaha Shishyan Shiksha Shushru Shartan Sharmanya Deshamagataha Varshanti to Sapatnika Stubingan Nagarachuvat, Swadesham Gantukamudya, Puna Prayatu Budyataha, Smritihi Suramani Asyat, Swakarmasu Suhrisucha, Dure Vasan Nadure Stu, Hridi Maitrim Pravadhayam. Now I come to the subject. Indology is the study of India from different perspectives. It can broadly be divided into two. Classical Indology, the study pertaining to ancient India, including in its gamut the medieval one and the, and the modern Indology, the study pertaining to contemporary India, its society, its culture, its uh, thought currents, its achievements in various fields, its aspirations and urges. For classical Indology, the evidence mostly rests on the vast number of ancient texts, archaeological remains, the coins, the inscriptions, the historical kavyas, the royal proclamations, and so on, which the scholars visit and revisit to draw a holistic picture of India down the centuries that can serve as a guide to modern Indology, serving as a prelude to the evolution of the various social institutions of India. India has been home to one of the most ancient civilizations of the world, which has been enriched by countless sages and seers, thinkers and philosophers, grammarians and linguists, artists and architects, physicians and surgeons, mathematicians and astronomers, etymologists and lexicographers, the explorers, the poets, the playwrights, and so on. From Vedic mathematics to the Lilavati of Bhaskaracharya is a long journey for the development of mathematics, with mathematicians like Brahmagupta with their theorems appearing in between. So is it a long journey for Ayurveda, from the Atharvaveda to Charaka, Sushruta, Bhela, and a host of other exponents of the science of Ayurveda. India gave to the world two of its greatest epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, the latter of encyclopedic proportions and the vast Puranic literature, comprising 18 Puranas and the same number of Upapuranas, with astounding variety of subject matter, the myths, the parables, and so on. Now I will come to say there's something. The flow of, I, I'm just omitting it because of the uh, constraints of time. 
the flow of creative activity in Sanskrit has continued down the centuries. It did not stop any time. Even in the present period, it continues with full force. Sanskrit literature is being enriched even now by thousands of works. With the opening up of India to the West, it has undergone sea change, both qualitative and quantitative. Novel called Navalika in its Sanskritized nomenclature as practiced in the West is widely practiced in Sanskrit at present. So is short story. A Vanak play, which was a rarity in days of yore, is the vogue now. So are the radio plays and the plays for the television. Even a film was attempted in Sanskrit called Shankaracharya, it not only won the hearts of the people, but also Oscar for its technical finesse. In poetry, free verse is a common enough occurrence. Even Japanese haiku has found its way into it. New styles and techniques have surfaced in all types of literary forms. In addition to kathas and akshayikas, Sanskrit literature has many stories now. Odes and sonnets are not the property of the English literature alone now. Sanskrit literature also abounds in them. So are ghazals, Sanskritized as kajjalikas, and kavvalis, Sanskritized as kakalikas. In keeping with the demands of the new age, new words have come to be coined in Sanskrit for new objects and ideas. There are works now in Sanskrit on subjects like the library science, the Pustakalaya Paricharya Prasuna, and Economic Survey of India, Bharatasya Arthikam Sarvekshanam. Sanskrit literature did not have an autobiography so far. This humble devotee of Saraswati has attempted one. Titled Bhavitavyanam Dwarani Bhavanti Sarvatra, it is expected to run into three volumes, of which the first one has already seen the light of the day while the second one is running through the press, while the work on the third one is in progress. All the three put together will comprise about a thousand pages. A new revolution of thoughts is taking place in Sanskrit literature at present. The classical Indological studies in India from the modern viewpoint got a kickstart with the setting up of the Asiatic Society of Bengal at Calcutta on 15th January 1784 by William Jones, a polyglot who had intimate acquaintance with 28 languages, including Sanskrit, which he learned as judge and so mastered it just in three years he could freely converse with traditional pundits. Jones translated the Manusmriti, the Abhijnana Shantala, the Gita Govinda and the Hitopadesha, subsequent to the setting up of the Asiatic Society of Calcutta, was opened a branch of the same at Bombay. <coughs> History of Indology in India would be incomplete without the mention of Grierson, who is remembered for his inimitable work they run for 20 years. The Indian Archaeological Society of India a private organization has also been contributing significantly to the field by its publication, the Pora Tattva, which started in 1967 and is continuing still. Now, the earliest evidence of the Indian art is furnished by the Indus Valley, the best known sites of which are Harappa and Mahindradaro, with the remains of well-developed city civilization with houses, markets, and drainage system. India had well-laid cities with lofty mansions, with roads lined with trees, and well-stocked markets to which repaired traders and merchants from all parts of the world. There are texts like the Samarangana Sutradhara, the Manasol Lasa for laying cities and towns. Similarly, there are texts like the Upavana Vinoda for laying gardens. There were water channels for storing water, both for drinking and irrigation. There is inscriptional evidence of huge dams having been built. The science of agriculture was very developed in ancient India, as can be seen from texts like the Krishik Shastra, Krishi Parashara, the Brihat Sakta, etc., which deals with the selection of soil for planting seeds, as also with plant diseases, their cure, rotation of crops, irrigation, so on. Now, one paragraph I'm omitting. Aeronautics has many Sanskrit works, like the Yantra Sarvaswa of Bharadwaja, the Shakti Sutras of Agastya, the Saudamani Kala of Ishwara, the Vayu Tattva Prakarana, and the 
ವೈಶ್ವ ಮರುತಂತ್ರ ಆಫ್ ಶಾಕಟಾಯನ ದಿ ಧೂಮ ಪ್ರಕರಣ ಆಫ್ ನಾರದ ದಿ ವ್ಯೋಮಯಾನ ತಂತ್ರ ಆಫ್ ಶೌನಕ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಿ ವಿಮಾನ ಚಂದ್ರಿಕಾ ಆಫ್ ನಾರಾಯಣ ವಿಚ್ ಆರ್ ಆಲ್ ಸ್ಟಿಲ್ ಇನ್ ಮ್ಯಾನುಸ್ಕ್ರಿಪ್ಟ್ ದಿ ಬೃಹತ್ ಸಂಹಿತ ಆಫ್ ಪರಾಶರ ಇಸ್ ದಿ ಬಿಗೆಸ್ಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಪರ್ಹ್ಯಾಪ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಸೋರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಹೈಡ್ರೋಲಾಜಿಕಲ್ ನಾಲೆಜ್ ಆಫ್ ಏನ್ಷಿಯಂಟ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ದೇರ್ ವಾಸ್ ಎ ಸ್ಪೆಷಲ್ ಮೆಥಡ್ ಕಾಲ್ಡ್ ದಕಾರ್ಗಲ ಟು ಡಿಟರ್ಮಿನ್ ದಿ ಸಬ್ ಸಾಯಿಲ್ ವಾಟರ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಗ್ಯಾದರ್ಡ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಓಲ್ಡ್ ಟೆಕ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ದಿ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ಸ್ ವರ್ ದಿ ಗ್ರೇಟೆಸ್ಟ್ ವಾಟರ್ ಹಾರ್ವೆಸ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಎ ಥಾರೋ ನಾಲೆಜ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಅಂಡರ್ಗ್ರೌಂಡ್ ವಾಟರ್ ವೇನ್ಸ್ ವಿತ್ ಪರ್ಫೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಸಿಸ್ಟಮ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಹೋಮ್ಸ್ ಅಗ್ರಿಕಲ್ಚರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹೋರ್ಟಿಕಲ್ಚರ್ now we come to page 9 you know from ashokan times india came to be dotted with inscriptions their discovery decipherment editing translation and study became a fashion with many a scholar indian and foreign these inscriptions in all languages sanskrit pali prakrit and the regional provided a mine of information on the history of india but for the discovery of the ilahabad stone pillar inscription nothing would have been known of samudra gupta who built up one of the greatest of the empires similarly but for the discovery of the bhitri stone pillar inscription little would have been known of the successor skandagupta who fought a deadly battle with the hunas at one point having had to spend a night on the bare earth chititala shayaniye yena neeta priyama but taking up the gauntlet again had dealt a death blow on them ಹೂಣೈರ್ ಯಸ್ ಸಮಾಗತ ಸಮರೈ ದೋರ್ಭ್ಯಾಂ ಧರಾ ಕಂಪಿತ ಸಿಮಿಲರ್ಲಿ ಬಟ್ ಫಾರ್ ದಿ ಮನ್ಸೋರ್ ಸ್ಟೋನ್ ಪಿಲರ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಕ್ರಿಪ್ಷನ್ ಪ್ರೆಷಸ್ ಲಿಟಲ್ ವುಡ್ ಹೆಬ್ ಬಿನ್ ನೋನ್ ಆಫ್ ಯಶೋಧರ್ಮನ್ ಹೂ ದ ಎಂಪೈರ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಟೆಂಡೆಡ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದಿ ಹಿಮಾಲಯಾಸ್ ಟು ದಿ ವೆಸ್ಟರ್ನ್ ಓಷನ್ ಐ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಸ್ಟೆನ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದೇರ್ ದಿ ಕಂಪೋಸರ್ by the sheer force of the repetition of the particle a or ang has given an idea of the uh, extent of his empire alauhityopakanthat talavana gahano patyaka damahindra daganga shlishta sano stuhani shikharinah paschimad apaye mehi just a is aganga shlishta sano stuhani shikharinah paschimad apayo dehi ಸಾಮಂತೈರ್ ಯಾಹುದ್ ದ್ರವಿಣ ಹೃತಮದೈ ಪಾದಯೋ ರಾನಮದ್ಭಿಶ್ಚೂಡ ರತ್ನಾಂಶು ರಾಜೀವ್ ಗತಿಕರ ಶಬಲಾಶ್ ಭೂಮಿ ಭಾಗ ಕ್ರಿಯಂತೆ ಆಲೌಹಿತ್ಯೋಪಕಂಠ ಲೌಹಿತ್ಯ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಪುತ್ರ ಆಲೌಹಿತ್ಯೋಪಕಂಠ ತಲವನ ಗಹನೋ ಪತ್ಯಕಾತ್ ಆ ಮಹೀಂದ್ರ ದ ಮಹೀಂದ್ರ ಮಾನ್ಸನ್ ಆಲೌಹಿತ್ಯೋಪಕಂಠ ತಲವನ ಗಹನೋ ಪತ್ಯಕಾ ದಾ ಮಹೀಂದ್ರಾತ್ ಆಗಂಗಾ ಶ್ಲಿಷ್ಟ ಸಾನೋ ದಿ ಹಿಮಾಲಯ ಆಗಂಗಾ ಶ್ಲಿಷ್ಟ ಸಾನೋ ಸ್ತುಹಿನ ಶಿಖರಿಣ ಪಶ್ಚಿಮ ದಾಪಯೋ ದೇಹಿ ದಿ ವೆಸ್ಟರ್ನ್ ಓಷನ್ that was the expanse of his empire <coughs> he had brought even the mighty mihirkula to the, to his knees mihirkula nirpe narchitam pada yugmam for deciphering inscriptions knowledge of different scripts was necessary this led to the development of the science of paleography a pioneering attempt in this was the book indian paleography by g buller followed by the hindi work prachin lipi mala of gauri shankar hirachand odha and the works carrying the same title as that of bueller of ath dani and rajbali pande in the context of the importance of inscriptions i would like like to recount here an incident and with this will proceed towards the conclusion of my presentation the session of the constituent assembly of india for drafting the constitution of india was on a question came up as to what could be the indigenous indigenous name for india that should go into the constitution a number of suggestions came up like hindustan aryavarta bharatvarsha the opinion was closing in on bharatvarsha somebody at that moment raised the point whether there is any archaeological evidence in support of it pat came the reply from acharya narendra deva a member of the constituent assembly he quoted a passage from the hathi gumpha inscription of kharavela at bhubaneswar 
which has the word Bharatvarsha, the Pratchar form of Sanskrit Bharatvarsha. With the inscriptional evidence produced, this name Bharatvarsha was adopted for the country in the constitution of India. Classical Indology, the study of ancient India, is an ongoing process. It has rich past, rich present, and hopefully equally rich future. It cannot exhaust itself. It has both width and depth, newer and newer explorations and discoveries, and the revisiting of the old ones will throw into its vortex newer and newer information with all its vastness, not only in geography, but also in traditions, customs, manners, rites, rituals, communities, religions, languages, literatures, and philosophies. India will continue opening up new vistas to those who want to dig deeper into it. That is what Indology is, the study of India, the incredible India. Thank you. We got the instruction to finish at 1.30 because of important lunch. So I asked uh, the second speaker because I feel very guilty uh, not to give her the, just to, to have, she has 15 minutes, almost 15 minutes, and to make presentation. We found by the skin of Carlo Manuel I from 1660 to 1608, uh, contributed to the arising of the interest for his studies and the creation of academic teaching in this discipline. Then the interest gradually diminished and ceased completely when the teaching of Holy Scripture was interrupted in 1627 and was restored after a century by the King Vittorio Amedeo II. All over Europe, on the contrary, the Oriental studies were, were cultivated fervently and with a great success. Any way owing to some outstanding scholar, the interest for the new discipline was still a fold. This interest was strengthened by the airport Amedeo Peron, brilliant and a renowned scholar of Coptic uh, and, uh, in Italy and abroad, expert in pathology. The, the purchasing in, uh, on uh, 1723 by the King Carlo Felice of the collection of the Egyptian archaeological fund and that pieces of the Piedmontese Bernardino Drovetti, who was a diplomatic in Egypt, and the creation, the crea the creation of the Egyptian Museum, this new subject affected the academic world and contributed to the flourishing of cultural history and philological interest toward the East. So the fruitful way was thus paved in Turin for the arising of the new interest and for far cultures. For what concerns uh, particularly the Middle and the Far East, Fundamental has been the work of the missionaries who contributed with their report to a deeper knowledge of the social condition and a more objective approach to the historical reality, the religious belief and customs of the region where they carried out their mission. <coughs> so the Tibetan studies in Italy became with the Jesuit Polito Desideri, who was able to deeply analyze the Tibetan culture and thought with particular attention to Buddhist philosophy. Then we must remind uh, the Capuchin Cassiano Belligatti and uh, Agost uh, Agostinian, the Agostinian Antonio Giorgi, whose monumental work concerning not only the field of linguistic and lexicography, but also history, geography, cosmogony, religion is not worthy, also for the systematic approach. But the first European who learned Sanskrit and who gave birth to the Indological study about the end of the 16th century was a merchant from Florence, Filippo Sassetti, author of the Letters from India. 
from the non other missionaries distinguish themselves by their methodological thoroughness and scientific accuracy. Uh, it is a long list, uh, I only cite uh, some, someone like Pietro Maffei, the Jesuit, uh, Roberto de Nobili, and, uh, and many, many others. Uh, uh, dunque, the description of India made by the Franciscan friar minor, minor Giovanni Battista Maoletti is are particularly devoted to the historical period and to the political events of our, our kingdom. Then many other uh, missionaries devoted uh, their, uh, their activity and their research on different aspects of uh, Indian culture. I also uh, remind the cap Captain Marco della Tumba, who brought the different system of the religion and the Hindustan and the Near Kingdom and the book, Indian books. But a great documentary, of a great documentary value, and for the information he gives also uh, about the Veda, Sam Shastra, and the Purana. But, uh, Particularly, the Carmelist Paulino da San Bartolomeo uh, is uh, not worthy. Among the most significant works of this talented Sanskriti of an encyclopedic erudition are two Sanskrit grammar, many works of different topics, and the viaggio and the, the um, for <coughs> travel to the India, to the India. Uh, then was Viaggio alle Indie Orientali. But uh, such an important and glorious season for culture and science was followed by a sudden interruption of the missionary contribution for <coughs> and a long period of poor interest for this field of studies. Uh, but the time was right for the official beginning of Indological studies, and this took place in 1852, when a chair in Sanskrit studies was established at the University of Turin and awarded to the eminent scholar Abbot Gaspare Correggio, whose work alone is enough to illustrate the greatness of the contribution given by Italy to the Indological studies, the help of a learned and influential politician the Americans bring the Sare allowed him to attend the two years specialization course on classical philology in Vienna. Uh, <coughs> where he got friendly with the Count Berardo di Pralormo, who was the ambassador of the King of the Savoy in the town. Therefore, Correggio happened to take part in a productive period of a great development of science and culture and social renewal. That with Carl Alberto's kingdom, 1831 and uh, 1849, brought to the establishment of several cultural institutions. The king himself financed the publication of important works, but the real author of the cultural policy of the Albertine age where was Prospero Balvo, the president of the Ac Academy of Science, who, assisted by a large group of intellectuals, operated a wide project of cultural renewal and of political and institutional reformation. Then Correggio went to Paris, <coughs> uh, attracted by uh, the school of the distinguished Indologist Burnouf, <coughs> and uh, where he spent many years in Paris. His achievement had been so deep that after only two years, he could undertake with scientific thoroughness the difficult and impressive task of publishing six volumes in the Vanagaric uh, characters, appropriately recorded by the Imprimerie Royale, and the six volume of the Italian translation offering to Italy the prize of the first translation in Europe 
of the Ramayana of the Indian poet Vanmike. The Indian narrator 